Duran's Demerit, a Fading Kingdom story. Produced and directed by Daniel Myers. Written by Brian May. Narrated by Mackenzie May Fowler. A large, imposing instructor, Madame Fajian, stands in front of a gathering of young students. The room is naturally lit and prestigious looking, with ornately decorated book-lined walls. There is history in the space, a certain weighted energy in this room. The students all look on with a bit of fear in their eyes as Madame Fajian, a wise but intimidating elderly woman, speaks to them. You are entering a phase of your young lives that you will not soon forget. Should you be so lucky as to be blessed with a lifetime of learning, you will discover that the mind has many wonderful journeys over the course of its many moons. But not all outrightly positive lessons are learned outright positively. Young Goa is listening intently with eyes opened wide. He nods his head in agreement, though his mind is trying to fathom the deeper meaning of Madame Fajian's wise words. Hmm. Mistakes will be plentiful, but a supple and forgiving mind will allow those mistakes to soften one's internal boundaries, which, when melted away, eventually lead to maturity. And luckily for you, as teenagers especially, you will be making plenty of mistakes in your lifetime. And all the better. But grow from them, for failure allows us the opportunity to fill ourselves with fresh information, focusing our intention with the aim of learning the ultimate lesson. Madame Fajian lets the thought hang in the air. And what is this ultimate lesson? Tristan? Madame Fajian unexpectedly calls on Tristan, a very tall, sarcastic girl, who is completely caught off guard and fumbles her thoughts horribly. The ultimate lesson, Madame Fajian, is the... Um, it's the lesson of ultimate... Um, learning. The entire class lets out a stifled giggle having grown used to Tristan's comedic disregard for her studies. Demerit. Ding. Now there's a mistake you can certainly learn from. Madame Fajian, stern <laughs> but understanding, laughs aloud to herself as she continues. One never need look further than one's own surroundings to discover a simple answer. Madame Fajian indicates the room they're in as she looks around the hollowed hall filled with books, tomes, scrolls, and a vast wealth of knowledge. Garwa, please enlighten the classroom as to life's ultimate lesson. Garwa, a model student, clears his throat and is about to speak when suddenly... He is distracted by a door to the hall having been slightly set ajar. He looks and sees young Durand, who happens to be wildly late to class, poking his head through the doorway. Gerwa and Durand make eye contact. Gerwa, nervous to be caught, quickly turns back to Madame Fajian and continues as confidently as he can. Madame Fajian, the ultimate lesson of the life of the intellect is humility. Madame Fajian, tracing Gerwa's wandering gaze, looks to the door at the side of the room. It is shut, as it should be. There is silence as everyone awaits Madame Fajian's clarification. She turns back to the class and stares at Gurwa deeply before speaking. Exactly, young Gurwa. Humility. For when you can admit you know nothing, you can begin to learn everything. Gurwa is pleased with himself for having answered the question correctly. Madame Fajian walks around the space as she continues her lesson. Humility requires sacrifice. A sacrifice of ego. That is, putting aside oneself and one's own beliefs or interests for the sake of something beyond oneself. Say a sacrifice of soldiers for their country, or a sacrifice of one's own time for school and studies. Isn't that right, Master Durand? Gerwa swallows nervously, knowing Durand is absent from class, when suddenly... That is correct, Madame Fajian. 
I am a Wellington, after all. I know a thing or two about sacrifice. Durand and Madame Fajan lock eyes for a few moments as Durand steps forth from the back of the group. A loud horn rings out through the hallowed hall, signaling the end of their study session. The kids all begin to shuffle out of the space. Gurwa lets out a sigh of relief as he catches up with Durand, who walks past Madame Fajan confidently. I thought Fajan was going to can you like a nautic sardine for sneaking into class so late. In order to can a fish, you have to catch him first. Durand and Gurwa <laughs> laugh to themselves as they saunter out of the class. <laughs> Young Master Wellington. The two boys stop in place and turn to face Madame Fajan. Demerit for tardiness, but good try. Madame Fajan laughs aloud as Durand turns away dejectedly. Gurwa follows suit until... Gurwa. Gurwa, frozen in place, turns rapidly and confesses immediately. I will accept the demerit, Madame Fasian, for being distracted when Duran came in through the door. During my answer earlier, I apologize greatly. Madame Fasian smiles at Gurwa. You are a loyal friend, indeed. But I was going to tell you that I am proud of your studious efforts as of late. Thank you, Madame Fasian. You're welcome. Continue the good work. Maybe your academic example will inspire Mr. Wellington to take his studies more seriously. Wait, do I have a demerit still? Yes. The demerit you gave yourself is a good indication of self-discipline. One has to be humble enough to accept one's own punishment. Madame Fajan lets out a booming and joyous laugh, <laughs> truly enjoying her oftentimes comedic and cheeky mentorship. Gurwa and Durand walk out of class, having each learned a little lesson in humility. Durand and Gurwa, arriving to serve their demerit as instructed, stand on the mossy shoreline near the Lake of the Logos, a beautiful gathering of nature and wildlife set just outside the city of the intellects. Marine life is aplenty in the large lake, and at this hour of the morning, the water top is sprinkled with the anchored boats of fish farmers who wait patiently to reel in a catch. Gurwa, meanwhile, paces nervously near the water's edge. Madame Fasian gave her a demerit. She should be here. She will be in big trouble if she skips. Hmm. I wonder why you're so concerned about Tristan's attendance to demerit. It couldn't possibly be because you... I do not, Duran. You don't what? You know. No, I don't. I don't want to say it. You don't want to say what? I don't want to say that I don't have feelings for Tristan. You better not. Tristan appears suddenly behind Gurwa and gives him a playful shove. Gurwa slips atop a mossy stone and falls forward, stumbling straight into the shallow water. Ah, it's so cold! <laughs> Durand and Tristan laugh amongst themselves as Gurwa skips his way out of the frigid lake, drenched beneath the knees. I knew Madame Fajing was going to catch you, Durand. Everyone in class saw you come in. I thought everyone was going to be in the study section, not at the lectern. Yeah, well, did you lect learn your lesson? Yes, I did learn my lesson in humility, which of course is the ultimate lesson of ultimate learning. I'm going to teach you the ultimate lesson. Tristan playfully tackles Duran to the ground, and the two engage in a friendly wrestling match. Tristan, the larger of the two, gets the initial advantage and topples Duran easily. You guys should stop. You're going to get us in even more trouble. Gurwa tries to dry himself off as Duran tries to counter Tristan's grapple. The two roll nearer to the edge of the water as they jest and laugh. Tristan still has Duran pinned to the ground. You've gotten weaker, Master Wellington. No, I've just gotten smarter. Duran splashes Tristan. She rises to her feet from the water's crisp shock. Cheater! It's not cheating to use one's environment to one's advantage. All of the students stop. Madame Fajan walks towards them through the morning mist. Thankfully, that is precisely what all thriving creatures do. Our environment is indeed how we survive. We are nothing without it. Madame Fajan begins to smile and chuckle to herself, looking over the muddied and wet students before her. 
Today, we shall be learning to humble ourselves before nature. It looks like you lot have already begun. The soiled students all rise to their feet and gather themselves as Madame Fajan begins to wade out into the water. She stands completely still, knee-deep in the shallow waters of the lake. The kids all congregate on the shoreline, watching her quietly. Madame Fajan looks as if she is frozen, unmoving, staring out over the surface of the water. Are we supposed to follow her in there or something? Madame Fajan has a reason for everything she does. That's good for her. I wish she'd fill us in on it then. You'd have to be paying attention in order to be filled in. I'm going to fill your mouth with mud and rocks if you keep it up. Gerwa shushes immediately and turns his attention solely to Madame Fajan, who remains frozen in place. Suddenly, Duran begins to make his way out into the water near Madame Fajan. I'd wait until Madame Fajan tells us to do something. She is telling us to do something. She's just not saying it. <sighs> Durand is such a smarty pants. But I'm going in with him. Last one in the water is a dirty outlander. Tristan playfully shoves Gerwa and begins to follow Durand. Gerwa, cold and wet as he is, waits a few more moments on the shoreline. Why couldn't we serve Demerit inside? Gerwa reluctantly follows the two other students, stepping once again into the freezing cold water. Durand, Tristan, and Gerwa all step nearer to Madame Fajan. Both the Sea of Secrets and the Lake of Logos feed into one another in an ancient cycle of circulation and replenishment. Even while standing in these shallow waters, one can feel the eternal depth of the Sea of Secrets. I can't feel anything, really. I think my legs are numb. It could even be said that these waters are one in the same, for all life is connected on a fundamental level. Sea, lake, land, sky, the energy of life and living cannot help but constantly orbit itself. Living things always curiously exploring and searching for other living things. Madame Fajan calmly and slowly points down towards their feet. Without moving, the students look down and notice a large school of fish circling their legs. Are these baby black fins? Whoa! I heard these babies have extra row of teeth at the back of the mouth. <laughs> Makes for a wicked bite, Mark. Tristan jokingly pinches Gerwa on the leg. Ah, quit it! Gerwa steps aside to avoid the contact. Except these aren't the sea-dwelling blackfins. These are the species of inland baleen blackfins who filter algae and moss through their bristles for food. Exactly right, Gerwa. Some baby blackfins migrate downstream and end up in the deeper waters of the Sea of Secret, where they've evolved to defend themselves and hunt for larger, more dangerous prey. Hence the extra row of teeth. Madame Fajan leans toward the surface of the lake and gently grabs a baby blackfin in her hands. These, on the other hand, are as gentle as can be. They keep the lake clean and purified and allow other life forms beneath the surface of the water to thrive as well. Go ahead. Take one in your hands. The students all bend toward the water. Duran looks past to the surface of the water with measured intent. He grabs a baby blackfin easily. Got one! <laughs> Don't be so satisfied with yourself. It's not that hard. Tristan leans over and tries to grab a baby blackfin, but it continually slips through her grip. Stupid thing! Get over here! Leaning lower towards the water, Tristan begins to soak herself, frantic to capture one. After nearly diving headfirst into the water, Tristan finally surfaces with a fish, completely soaking wet from head to toe. See? Nothing to it! Everyone, fish in their hands, turns to Gerwa, who looks at the surface of the water nervously. It's okay to be hesitant, but know that some intelligence keep us from acting. Too much thinking can be a bad thing. Sometimes one must simply act. Gerwa swallows deeply and readies himself to grab a fish. He leans over slowly 
And suddenly, a baby blackfin jumps out of the water into the air and lands directly into Gerwa's hands. <laughs> Madame Fajan lets out her booming laughter. Or in this case, sometimes one must simply react. The students all calmly and carefully inspect the gentle baby black fins in their hands. As you can see, these black fin are gentle, calm, trusting, whereas other black fin evolve to be aggressive, tempered, and predatory. They start the same, but end on opposite spectrums. Can we blame one black fin for having to survive through the use of its teeth? Is one good and the other bad? How can we reconcile the differences between the two when both begin so small and so simply? The environment. One calls for teeth in. One calls for gomp. Such is life. Madame Vision places her fish back into the water. Imagine if every day of your lives you were uncertain if you were going to eat that morning, or that evening, or that week. You would be a much different person if that was the case. Sounds awful. Tristan places her blackfin back into the water. <laughs> to you, who is used to lavish breakfasts every morning, Nautic children, for example, wade out into their waters at sunrise to help their families gather enough fish for the entire community. They are trained early in the development of their fishing skills because it is required of them based on their environment. That's not the life for me. I'm happy to be born an intellect. Are you happy to be born an intellect? Or are you happy to have breakfast every morning? Isn't that the same thing? <laughs> yes, you have been afforded a life in a milieu where you can cultivate your mind and not worry about your next meal. It is indeed a luxury that can sorely serve to disconnect anyone from the natural world, from their environment. Duran places his black fin back into the water and points out toward the lake. And yet still, fish farmers catch and kill these peaceful baby blackfin, even though they don't have teeth. Ah, yes. This is the cruelest act of all, punishing the innocent. Madame Fajan looks at Duran deeply. They share a silent and knowing moment. And this is the painful reality of life. All life, in some way or another, must destroy other life in order to survive. Gerwa's fish flies out of his hands, jumping into the air once again and landing back into the water. Well, what about not eating fish or animals? Don't the Prairie Pride have a large agricultural ecosystem where they produce an abundance of fresh grain and vegetables? Correct. Vegetation, to your point though, is alive as well. Although its biological makeup is vastly different from our own. And to the blackfin who don't have teeth, I'd say, aren't algae alive? Doesn't the moss they feed on pulse with bacterial life? And which is better? Eating algae through bristles? Catching fish with hooks? Growing plants and vegetables? Who lives life correctly? Nautic? Pride? Intellect? Which way is best? Who is right and who is wrong to live the way that they do? The intellects are right, obviously, because we're, um, you know, intellectual. Ah, but one cannot live one's entire life inside the mine. Madame Fajan begins to walk out of the water back toward the shore. The students, partly intrigued, partly confused, follow her inland. Madame Vasion has led the students to a tall stone tower that stands at the edge of the city. Based on its location set slightly above the Silver City, from the top of the tower one can see out beyond the bounds of the Prairie Pride Kingdom, with the magnificent mountains and Enchanter's Forest blurry but looming large in the distance. This tower was built by a group of Prairie Pridesmen after the massacre at Diamond Bay. 
Its architecture and craftsmanship is wonderful. Durand studies the tower with a strange familiarity. The Pride are renowned for their reliable and relatively indestructible constructions. They have generations of experience studying stone and working with rock to their advantage. A pride structure is a proud structure, as they say. Except the pridesmen who built the tower did not do so voluntarily. They were prisoners. Wait a second. I thought they built us this tower as a gift. Didn't we save a bunch of pridesmen during the Battle of Diamond Bay? No! A bunch of pridesmen saved us during the massacre of Diamond Bay. And we turned on them. That's enough, Durand. Then the high intellects imprisoned the pridesmen who rebelled because of it, forced them to build this tower so we could spy on them, keep an eye on their kingdom and crops. Uh-uh. You're so full of it, Durand. You don't know what you're talking about, Tristan. Neither do you. Some of my family members died in that battle. That was a great victory for the intellects. If you don't like it, you can live in another kingdom. Take it easy, children. Duran, you think because you're all pampered and parentless that you're special and you can do and say whatever you want. Take it back. Tristan, that was mean. Oh, shut up, Gowa. You and your family are lucky to even be considered first rate. And you're lucky to even be considered an intellect, you dimwit. Madame Fajan begins laughing hysterically to herself. The children all suddenly stop and look to one another, filled with frustration and confusion. One is mad because she feels her beliefs are challenged. One is mad because he feels he's been betrayed. And the other is upset because he feels as if he doesn't belong. Whose anger is more justified? Who is right in their feelings? Who is wrong? The children all stand silently, upset and confused. No matter who you are, no matter human or animal, everyone and everything is struggling with something. Survival, sadness, etc. If only we thought of others as vulnerably and as willingly as we thought about ourselves, we'd see that we're all not so different. Madame Fajan lets the students stand with their feelings for a few moments. All of them are saddened and humbled by the silence. I'm sorry, Tristan. I do not think you are dimwit. I was upset because you said something mean to my friend. Tristan fiddles and kicks some stones beneath her feet. I get really mad sometimes. You know I don't mean it. I'm sorry too, you big sack of stone berries. Tristan moves forward and gives Gorwa a big bear hug, almost suffocating him in the process. She turns to Durand to offer a similar apology. And you too. You are special, Durand. I'm sorry for- Tristan trails off. Durand is nowhere to be found. Where did he go? Everyone looks around momentarily. They hear a mechanical trolley noise from inside of the tower. Durand is alone, making his way to the top of the tower. Tristan and Gorwa remain outside at the base of the tower as Madame Fajan moves toward it. When she ascends to the top of the stone tower, she sees Durand is looking out over the land beyond the Silver City, tears filling his eyes. Is it the heightened breeze or the heightened emotions watering your eyes? It's unfair. It's all so unfair. Everything that happened to my grandfather, to my family, to me. I didn't want to be in this situation. I don't want to know the things I do about the intellects. Imagine how much more you'd know if you came to class. I don't want to be different from my friends. I don't want to be without parents. Why can't I be like everyone else? What is everyone else like? Everyone else who is normal, who has parents. Everyone has parents, even if they don't know who they are. That is the beauty of biology. I wish I knew who mine were. I wish my own stupid kingdom would tell me. Sometimes I wish I could have been born in another kingdom. Kids in other kingdoms have their own worries as well. You know this, Durand. Do not over-intellectualize your pain. You are hurting, and sometimes that is enough. Feeling and thinking are not necessarily the same thing. Why won't you tell me anything else about my family? Because it is not my story to tell. 
Learning something at the wrong time in life can be akin to not learning it at all. Look out before you at all of this land. Can one know everything there is to know about everything under the sun? Certainly not. Now imagine the world you contain within yourself. It is infinitely larger and more expansive than the world we see with our eyes. And most of life's mysteries happen within us. Questions arise, answers are given, and more questions are inevitably asked. So it's not about achieving the answer, but how you go about asking the questions. All of which takes time. Durand lets Madame Fajan's words wash over him. You're saying I should be patient? As old as I am, I've been waiting for a few answers myself that I still haven't wrapped my mind around. Learning is a lifelong journey, and Durand Wellington, you are just at the beginning of yours. Trust me, you have plenty of living and learning ahead of you. Durand finally smiles, a noticeable change coming over his face. Now, meet me at the base of the tower. We shall return to the Silver City together. Durand begins to make his way down the tower. Madame Fajan hangs back for a moment, looking out over the land. Durand has made his way to the base of the tower near his friends, and Madame Fajan sees Durand and Tristan hugging. The three students all begin talking and fooling around casually as they always do. Madame Fajan then turns her attention to the horizon, as if she is looking for something. Suddenly, a dark rumor bird appears and lands near the edge of the stone tower. There you are. Perfect timing. The rumor bird is dark purple, slender and toned, and appears as if it is capable of going long distances unnoticed from those on the ground. Madame Fajan feeds a loose piece of bread to the bird and begins to speak. He is not quite ready, although he is showing himself to be wiser than his age. He has an amazing mind and spirit, but his emotions and frustration overpower him. You must wait to make contact, for I fear the results of revealing the truth to him this early. I know you grow impatient, but I beg of you, hold off on sending for Durand. At that, Madame Fajan sends the sleek rumor bird off into the boundless air. She looks longingly from the flying bird to Durand down below, and begins to descend the tower steps. The rumor bird, meanwhile, flies with accuracy and determination over the prairie pride, beyond the magnificent mountains, and out into the unknown. The End Fading Kingdoms will continue in Part 3, The Garden.